Welcome to today's webinar, Implementing an Effective Listeria Control Plan for Fresh Produce. My name is Karen Whitman, and I'll be hosting this webinar. Before I introduce today's presenter, I have a couple housekeeping items to go over with you. The webinar is recorded, and the recording will be available in one to two days. All questions will be answered at the end of the presentation portion, and any questions that are put into our queue that are not answered will be, follow, um, will be followed up with by our webinar or by our presenter after the webinar. Good morning. My name is Doug Marshall. Um, we have one more thing, um, questions. If you have questions, go into the queue, which is shown on the next slide. Um, at the bottom, there's a little area on the webinar panel where you can click on questions. Um, there, go ahead and enter any questions that you may have that come up during the webinar into the text box and then press send. That will put the uh, question into the queue um, for our question and answer section after um, Dr. Marshall's presentation. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you today's presenter, um, Dr. Doug Marshall, who is the Chief Scientific Officer with Eurofins Microbiology Laboratories, Incorporated, a division of the global life sciences company Eurofins Scientific. He also is co-founder and director of the Food Safety Institute, LLC, an integrated consulting and analytical services company affiliated with Eurofins. He currently holds adjunct professor positions with Colorado State University and Florida State College. He is, a he is a frequently invited speaker and a prolific book chapter writer. With over 250 publications and over 150 invited presentations, his scientific research and outreach interests focus on improving the microbiological quality and safety of food. Among these was the completion of the fourth four-volume handbook of food science, technology, engineering, which he co-edited. Dr. Marshall has been the recipient of a number of awards for his scholarly efforts, including the Mississippi Chemical Corporation Award of Excellence for Outstanding Work and the International Association for Food Protection Educator Award. He is a fellow of the Institute of Food Technologists, where he has previously served as chair of two divisions and two regional sections, member of the board of director, directors, an inaugural member and chair of the International Food Science Certification Commission, and a founder member of the Global Traceability Center. It is now my pleasure um, to hand this presentation over to Dr. Douglas Marshall. Okay, thank you, Karen. I have a uh, fairly large slide deck to go through today. I'm not going to dwell uh, too much time on each one of these. Everyone will have the opportunity to review the slide deck at a later period to get uh, uh, caught up in all the details. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with Eurofins, we are the leading uh, laboratory network worldwide. We have over 225 laboratories in about 40 countries, over 25,000 employees who deploy about 130,000 tests on a daily basis. Uh, in the U.S., we have around 18 uh, food laboratories serving uh, this industry sector. Um, also, we are present in uh, Canada as well. Today, I'm going to address how you, how you can use what I call my food safety paradigm in order to get control over Listeria monocytogenes in a fresh produce um, manufacturing uh, situation. What I'm going to focus in on are some pre-harvest controls, some post-harvest controls, and how you can use rapid and specific detection to inform you on how to reduce your risk and how to better manage your listeria control plan. And then eventually, hopefully, you can implement these and get behavior change to get a better uh, handle on this bacterium. Listeria monocytogenes is a gram-positive, non-spore-forming, rod-shaped bacterium. It is facultatively anaerobic, meaning it could grow with or without oxygen, so vacuum packaging is not a very effective barrier. It is also psychotrophic, meaning it can um, multiply and grow at refrigeration temperatures. So again, although chilling will reduce its growth rate, it's not a preventative control. 
Listeria is uh, sensitive to heat processing, so if you have the ability to uh, do a pasteurization step, that is an effective kill step. Uh, the organism is widespread in nature. It is found in all kinds of fresh produce production environments. Therefore, um, when you look in the literature, you'll see prevalence rates of typically 1% to 3%, but I've seen some reports showing prevalence rates up to 60% on produce coming into um, produce manufacturing facilities. So you can expect it to make um, almost a daily appearance coming into your plant. Um, Listeria monocytogenes as a foodborne pathogen was first recognized in 1981 due to a uh, produce-related um, outbreak. And in this particular scenario, contaminated coleslaw that was fertilized, um, where the cabbage was fertilized with sheep manure in the sheep um, we're carrying listeria monocytogenes. The illness caused by this bacterium is known as listeriosis. It's a very, very rare foodborne disease agent, only causing about um, um, 1,600 annual infections. Unfortunately, it has a very high mortality rate of about 20 to 30 percent, leading to about 250 fatalities. Those that are most risk for listeriosis are pregnant women and their fetuses, and the bacterium can actually uh, uh, cross the placental barrier and uh, cause infections of the fetus in utero. Other individuals include those who may be immunocompromised, either by being very young, very old, or have some underlying con condition, such as the use of immunosuppressive um, drug therapies, that may be used for cancer and chemotherapy use, uh, or organ transplant patients, or those with other underlying infections, such as HIV infection. And so when you also look in the literature, some uh, advocacy groups for uh, women, uh, particularly pregnant women, do advise uh, on their websites to avoid consumption of unwashed and unpeeled uh, produce, and specifically sprouts. FDA, however, does not advise such measures, and CDC says wash, scrub, and dry fresh produce prior to consumption. So again, where does uh, Listeria monocytogenes exist out in the environment? Well, it's quite widespread. It's found in soils, irrigation waters, chemical spray water, uh, in manure or um, compost that is uh, inadequately um, treated prior to use. It is found in air and dust associated with wild and domestic animals, and people can also cross-contaminate produce. In terms of post-harvest sources, again, human handling is an issue. Um, improperly cleanable and sanitizable harvesting equipment, um, transport containers and vehicles, um, vermin, the presence of insects, rodents, uh, other animals that might be present in or around the food processing environment or harvesting. Uh, or field uh, process environment, again, air and dust. Water is a big issue, uh, particularly water that's used for washing produce, rinsing produce, or cooling uh, produce. And then the equipment that's used uh, for these sorts of um, primary processing steps also can be a contamination source, as well as ice that is used for cooling. Because of its widespread nature, the steromonocytogenes is not a unique pathogen to the fresh produce industry. In fact, many other industries, such as the processed meat industry and the raw and pasteurized um, dairy products industries, have had a long history of issues with the steromonocytogenes. Only recently, however, have we begun to recognize that the organism can cause human disease due to consumption of uh, fresh uh, produce. Uh, again, some uh, more recent outbreaks after the first one associated with cabbage that have been associated with, with um, listeria mycetogenes in 2011 in my home state, Colorado cantaloupes, um, caused a very large outbreak and killed several people. And it was traced back to poor sanitary facility design and practices. In 2014, in Illinois, uh, mungbing sprouts were linked to an outbreak, again, for the same reasons. 
Likewise, in 2014, uh, there was a California caramel outbreak due to poor sanitary facility design and practices, and then the long shelf life of the caramel apples was another contributing factor. Um, and then uh, this year, obviously, the thing that's making the press for a lot of folks in this sector is in Washington State, a very large um, recall is currently uh, underway due to contem potentially contaminated frozen vegetables. And in this case, uh, the epidemiology is not quite clear, but uh, the bottom line is um, the manufacturer might not have had a very robust environmental monitoring program to be able to detect um, Listeria monocytogenes in the uh, processing environment. And if you can't find it, then you're not really going to effectively uh, install intervention. Uh, there is a new FIFS Proto safety rule that is on the books that recently came out. And some of the key requirements of this proto safety rule focus on controls for agricultural water. This includes um, uh, mandatory testing for uh, water quality. Biological soil amendments. <clears throat> Again, um, if you are using these, then you need to make sure that they are free from pathogens. There is a section on sprouts. I'm really not going to dive into that section. But if you want more, you can certainly look this up on the FDA website. There is a section on control of domesticated and wild animals, uh, primarily in the uh, production environment. Section on worker training, health and hygiene, and equipment tools in buildings. Again, these really are GMPs, but they specifically highlight those in the produce safety rule. Um, it applies to both uh, domestic and imported raw agricultural commodities, such as fruits, vegetables, mushrooms, tree nuts, sprouts, and mixtures of intact fruits and vegetables. It does not apply to produce commodities that are rarely consumed raw. And again, how do you define rarely consumed raw? Uh, that's obviously in the eyes of, um, of the person making that determination. It also does not apply to produce used for personal or farm consumption. There also is an exemption for produce that has a kill step as part of its process, as long as that kill step has been properly validated and verified. It also only covers the harvestable portion, including the peels and shells, but not the rest of the plant that is not consumed. I want to dive into produce water here for uh, just a minute or two and uh, talk to you about some of the testing requirements for that. But in terms of uh, what water is defined, this is going to be both pre-harvest water. Primarily, you're looking at irrigation water that's directly applied. It may also imply a water that is used as a vehicle to transport agricultural chemicals to the crop. And then there's also a section on post uh, harvest uh, and harvest uh, water use for washing and cooling uh, protocols. So there are statements regarding how you manage this water, how the water could be treated, how it's monitored, and then uh, a section on periodically um, doing some testing to make sure the water is meeting these requirements. So what then are those requirements? Well, here's the testing regime. If you're using surface water for agricultural use, then the expectation is you're going to collect 20 samples over the first two to four years, then a minimum of five samples annually if everything is in compliance. If you're using groundwater, then the expectation is four samples over the first year, then a minimum of one sample annually, again, if you are in compliance. If you're out of compliance, then you need to test to make sure you get that water into compliance. And we'll talk do you about that in just a second on what you can do if you're out of compliance. So what do you test for? Well, what you're testing for is um, just generic Escherichia coli in a 100 mil sample of that water. And so your target levels are going to be based on um, a geometric mean and a statistical threshold value. I'm not going to go into those definitions in this talk. Again, you can look those up on the um, Produce Safety Rule website. So for water not meeting those criteria, these are what you have in terms of options. Uh, there is a pre-harvest interval. So this is a time that is defined as days where um, pathogenic microbes are considered to die off 
um, between the last irrigation uh, application and the day of harvest. So the assumption is, is that these pathogens will have a die-off rate of a half a log per day for up to four days. Um, if you have data in your particular application where that die-off rate is greater, then you need to be able to prove that, and you can use that as your die-off rate. So again, you need to demonstrate that after that um, interval time, you can reach these target levels. Option two is again applying a time interval for microbial removal between harvest and the end of storage or removal during commercial activities such as washing. So again, you need to have your own data to be able to validate what that time interval is. And again, you're looking for these uh, microbial targets for E. coli. The third option is just to continue the use of that water um, for both uh, uh, pre-harvest as well as post-harvest uses. Or you can treat the water uh, to bring it within compliance. The issue with this produce safety rule is none of these options directly relate to control of listeria monocytogenes in the water supply. All it does is your targets are targeting E. coli. So you need to know is there a relationship between E. coli counts and the prevalence rate of listeria monocytogenes. So um, some of the data and literature shows that produce irrigation water can have listeria monocytogenes rates of about 30%. What this means is if you are applying irrigation water, you have a reasonable probability you're also applying wisteria to the edible portion of that uh, crop. We also know that field contamination of wisteria monocytogenes increases up to 24 hours after an irrigation or a rain event. And then the other contributing factor is if the field is in close proximity to water sources, then you get increased listeria monocytogenes contamination rates of that edible portion. Let's turn now and talk about post-harvest water risk. So there is uh, uh, some evidence in the literature that if you take warm produce out of the field and you wash it or you hydrocool it with cold water, then you get a negative pressure differential between um, the produce and the water and that can potentially, quote, suck in or internalize the bacteria that are on the surface of the product, and they can get into the pores and the cut um, and the stem ends of the, uh, or the blossom ends of the uh, particular material. And if you internalize the microbes, then they are going to be protect, physically protected from any subsequent decontamination um, procedures that you're using, such as sanitizing chemical washes. We also know from the literature that depending on which chemical you're using and the parameters involved in that decontamination chemical use, is attempting to wash and remove listeria monocytogenes from fresh produce, most of the time you're going to achieve a 10 to 100 fold decrease in the population. You also need to understand that the parameters affecting this um, decontamination routine go beyond just the amount of chemical that you're using. So the temperature of the application, the hardness of your water, the pH of the water, the organic load going into the wash water, all can influence the effectiveness of that chemical. And lastly, we know that failure to maintain proper chemical concentration can lead to bulk inoculation of glycerin monocytogeny. So again, if you've got one piece going into a wash tank that has listeria, you run the risk of transporting that listeria and that wash water to contaminate every other item that goes into that wash tank. So instead of decontaminating, you're basically contaminating uncontaminated portions during this wash process. Let's turn now and talk very quickly about soil amendments in the produce safety rule. Um, so soil amendments is basically taking raw manure or stabilized composting, applying that to the field as a uh, soil amendments, so making it a better soil, adding nutrients to the soil, and so forth. We know that raw manure has a, a reasonable probability of having listeria monocytogenes, so you are basically run the risk of broadcasting uh, this bacterium on the field prior to planting. Certainly there is a big concern if you're applying this to a field while plants are and harvestable portions are uh, ready to be harvested. 
So um, right now, I just want you to focus on the third bullet item as, as something to ponder. FDA um, is currently assessing the uh, number of days needed between application and harvesting, but they estimate it's going to take between five and 10 years to complete that data uh, analysis. Um, so what are your options? Well, right now the recommendation is you can follow the USDA's National Organic Program by using uh, one uh, of the following two options. You can do a 120-day interval between application of raw manure for crops in contact with soil or 90 days for crops not in contact with soil. Again, my advice to you is uh, you probably should uh, verify whether this um, uh, withdrawal period is acceptable in your particular location for the kinds of uh, crops that you are growing and harvesting. Um, the microbial requirements for this compost is you need to have no detectable pathogens. So that includes Salmonella, Fecalicoliforms, E. coli, um, and our hemorrhagic strain, O157, as well as Listeria monocytogenes. Okay, a few comments on domesticated and wild animals. Uh, we know, for example, that the uh, cabbage associated coleslaw outbreak happened because the field was fertilized with raw manure from sheep who um, had the steromonocytogenes in their feces. And so what you need to make sure is that these, any other kinds of animals that are in that production environment, you protect the crop from um, potential contamination by those animals. So you must examine the growing area prior to harvest and make sure that you um, designate portions of that field as non-harvestable based on evidence of animal intrusion events. So the kinds of animals you're dealing with include grazing or working animals. So these would be animals that you would normally expect to be found in a, in a farm environment. Um, but again, you need to make sure that these animals are not gaining access to, the, to that crop um, when it's growing and certainly before it's harvested. Uh, also an expectation that you do something uh, related to wild animal intrusion. Um, so you could erect barriers, you could do, um, uh, again, walk the field to make sure that you don't have any visible signs of wild animal intrusion. If you want more help with uh, FISMA related um, activities in terms of becoming compliant with uh, FISMA expectations, we do um, offer a number of FISMA-related services. You can contact us at the email uh, listed at the bottom of this page for all of the kinds of help um, that we offer in terms of uh, training, consulting, and auditing services. I want to turn now and spend the last uh, portion of this webinar talking about the biology of Listeria monocytogenes and some of the um, expected interventions you should be doing to control this bacterium in the processing environment. And what you need to understand is that any pathogen that is in a processing environment, if you look on the left side of this uh, graph or this uh, uh, slide, you'll see that the organism is um, exposed to a large number of challenges in that environment. So you have um, water activity influences, temperature influences, whether hot or cold. You've got uh, the relative presence of other microbes. Some can be beneficial, some can be antagonistic. You've got the influence of packaging, and then you've got antimicrobials, either used in uh, sanitation as wash water solution uh, chemicals, or maybe as direct ingredients. So all of these, um, uh, or challenging environments for the bacterium, so for it to survive, it's got to be a pretty tough critter. So um, this is an example of uh, what you might want to think about in terms of ways to design a process for fresh produce that allows you to have some potential controls for Listeria monocytogenes. So I'll just run through these quickly. So dry cleaning and sorting to remove rotted material and field debris. We know that rotted material can potentially harbor Listeria monocytogenes. So if you just physically remove that, you're removing the load of Listeria coming in 
to your processing plant. Um, you could do a shower pre-wash to again get additional removal of soils and debris. You can use an immersion water into a sanitizer tank. You can counter flow. So again, uh, the dirtiest um, material is going to be first presented. And as the product flows through, it's getting cleaner and cleaner. Uh, be aware that uh, something like an apple put into an immersion tank, these apples will float on the surface. So are you getting uh, full contact of all surfaces of the apple, for example, in that sanitizer wash solution? Uh, depending on the sanitizer chemical used, you may need to do a uh, further rinse step to remove any sanitizer residue. Then it's a good idea to do some sort of water um, removal step because, again, uh, Listeria loves to thrive in wet environments. So if you are doing things like wet packing the produce, you're creating a situation that might be ideal for Listeria monocytogenes proliferation during subsequent uh, storage, transportation, and retail display. Um, lastly, proper uh, control of the chill chain, in other words, rapid chilling, as well as um, ensuring that this product maintains itself in a cold uh, condition is critical because, again, Listeria, because it's psychotropic, can grow at refrigeration temperatures. But the lower the temperature, the slower the growth rate. So given that um, uh, example processing flow, um, what are some contributing factors that have led to Listeria monocytogenic outbreak? Well, the first one is inadequate kill steps. So uh, some fresh produce have gone through wash systems where there was no antimicrobial in the wash water. And because of that, then the microbial counts in the water increase. And so every time you could potentially put a clean piece of produce coming out of the field in the wash tank, and then contaminate it, um, that's not a good situation. Okay, refrigeration temperatures not held um, at a low enough temperature. In other words, the organism can multiply faster as the temperature rises. Inadequate product flow through the processing plant is an ex another example. Poor personal hygiene. Having a long refrigerated shelf life is a contributing factor for uh, listeriosis. Inadequate cleaning and sanitation, when I talked about the uh, four recent outbreaks, this is a key factor that was identified in the epidemiology of those outbreaks. Inadequate environmental monitoring and control, this relates to the one that I just described. If you're not doing environmental monitoring, how do you know whether your cleaning and sanitation program is working? And then also inadequate end product testing becomes the ultimate arbiter of whether or not you're producing safe product. So I'll give you a few more examples in each one of these contributing factors. So again, inadequate kill step processing. If you are manufacturing uh, fresh produce, you may not have a definitive kill step. So what you're looking at is a combination of various hurdles to um, get control over listeria. You may not be able to eliminate it, but if you control it, at least you're doing uh, the best you possibly can. Also, if you do not have a kill step, you may want to revisit your HACCP plan and ask whether or not your critical control points are truly effective or not. So some examples are temperatures too low, the exposure time of whatever treatment you're using is too short, the chemicals that you're using um, may start off at a kill, uh, at a lethal uh, concentration. But as you continue to dilute with product and more water, you can dilute out that sanitation chemical. So you need to make sure you're doing proper dosing during the entire duration of that step. And then many times, these processes used in fresh produce have never been validated as uh, control steps for Listeria monocytogenes, nor are they routinely verified that they actually work during actual use. Okay, refrigeration temperature too high. I'll give you an example here. There's evidence in the literature that 55% of household units and 32% of retail store units are incapable of, measure, of keeping refrigeration temperatures below 9 degrees Celsius. And so proper refrigeration is 5 degrees or lower. 
And here's an example of what small increases in temperature can do to the growth of Listeria monocytogenes. On the x-axis, we're talking storage time at, at the storage temperatures listed. And the y-axis is the population size. And so if you look, yes, the organism can grow at 3 degrees, but it grows much slower at an abuse of temperature of 11 degrees. Some additional contributing factors. Inadequate cleaning and sanitation. This is a big one for the fresh produce industry. Clearly, this is going to be a battle in any food manufacturing plant between uh, the need of production to be able to run product through and get something uh, into retail so you get revenue back versus the needs of sanitation. And that's designed to make sure that, <clears throat> that that production environment is working correctly. What we know is that Listeria monocytogenes can have influence rates of very high in things like floor drains in these manufacturing environments. So is it uh, <clears throat> permanent Listeria that's living in the floor drains, or is it transient Listeria coming in on the product? We also know that Listeria can find its way onto direct product contact surfaces, such as the air belts, brushes, and wash things. Where are they coming from? Again, the good question to ask is, are they coming in on the raw material? Or are they uh, cross-contaminants in the production environment? Inadequate product flow is another example. And this is failure to segregate treated from raw product. This is particularly related to common use materials, such as bins, totes, um, common equipment, as well as utensils. <coughs> Excuse me. Also, failure to segregate employees working in the raw area versus the treated locations. When you look at um, direct product contact harbored sites for the stereomonocytogenes, these are some common areas that are found in food manufacturing plants and also found in uh, fresh produce processing environments. Um, I don't know how many of you have tried to clean a blast freezer and to sanitize a blast freezer, but we do know that Listeria can uh, establish resonance in such environments and are very difficult to remove and control. And every time you start those things up, you're blasting live organisms onto <coughs> potentially finished ready-to-eat product. Um, additional areas are condensate that um, has the potential to drop on a direct product contact surfaces is not an uncommon uh, uh, situation, as well as the tools that are used to actually clean and sanitize equipment, as well as to maintain equipment, can also be sources. Some additional contributing factors are personal hygiene. Um, you know, sometimes when you go into food uh, processing situations, particularly those handling raw produce, there's a lack of attention placed to uh, employee personal hygiene by the manufacturers. This includes clothing. Um, many times even in uh, harvesting, uh, the employees are not um, properly attired, and that attire is not well maintained, and you can get cross-contamination in the field during harvesting. Okay, shelf life too long. Uh, I would make the argument, at least for Listeria monocytogenes, if you have not done a um, shelf life study where you're actually challenging with Listeria monocytogenes, are you basing your shelf life based on product quality or based on controlling Listeria monocytogenes growth? So that may be something you should consider. Okay, inadequate environmental monitoring. Um, this is a key thing. Uh, environmental monitoring in and of itself is not a control step, but rather it's a way to monitor whether your control steps are actually working. And what you're using environmental monitoring for is to detect hot spots where you can find listeria that have potential to get into direct product contact surfaces. And um, once you have detected those, then you need to prove that you can control those hot spots. Again, you do that by environmental monitoring. And you also use environmental monitoring to do daily measuring of effectiveness of your general cleaning sanitation routine. 
Our recommendation is to test for listeria species rather than listeria monocytogenes because the prevalence rate of listeria species is usually greater than the prevalence rate of monocytogenes. So it gives you a, a better opportunity to control monocytogenes if you're controlling other listeria species as well. We do have guides. Um, that are freely uh, available for download on our website. The URL is listed there, so we have EMP guides. We also have webinars that you can view. Some additional uh, contributing factors are uh, inadequate end product testing. Um, the issue here is the failure to monitor in high risk ingredients. So for example, if you are a production facility that's uh, processing many different kinds of fresh produce, do you know, do you have a risk ranking of which produce uh, varieties are your highest and lowest risks? How do you know unless you do product testing? Um, product testing is useful to detect gross contamination events. It's usually not very useful to detect sporadic contamination events. So make sure that your testing is sufficiently robust to be able to detect both. If you are running a rework, you can also use product testing of that rework material to decide whether or not it's worth accepting the risk of doing that rework. And in all this situation, we recommend that you test for listeria monocytogenes because that is the definitive pathogen amongst the um, listeria species. So when you look at the uh, FISMA circle of life, uh, testing can be used to address all of these issues and these components and those records then inform you on, on your day-to-day -day, um, management decisions. So when you are looking at developing and monitoring and assessing your Listeria control plan, if you have issues with Listeria monocytogenes in your facilities or your products, you really need to step back and reassess the effectiveness of that plan. So these are some, some things you should look at. Number one is what are the population levels of Listeria monocytogenes coming into the facility in your raw materials or your ingredients? That includes processed water. You need to look at your efficacy of your kill steps or your control steps. You also need to look at what kinds of controls do you have after that uh, control uh, kill step. In other words, use your environmental monitoring data to see how those are working. You need to think about how uh, Lacera monocytogenes could proliferate in your product after it's been manufactured, and then look at your testing records. So when you're looking at your efficacy of your control steps, if you have kill steps, um, do they work? The only way to determine that is to do challenge testing. You could also do computer modeling. You can look at the literature, you can consult experts for expert opinions. Looking at the effectiveness of your post fill controls, do you know where you have Listeria monocytogenes in that processing environment that could potentially contaminate the product after these uh, kill steps? And once you know those sources, do you have the ability to control those sources of Listeria monocytogenes? So here's just an example of a potential process intervention. If you're using, uh, let's say, an organic acid, in this case it's, listeria, it's uh, lactic acid, uh, this is a challenge on listeria monocytogenes. Again, looking at the amount of the chemical is absolutely key in determining whether you have the ability to control, which would be the orange line, or actually to kill, which would be the red line, is entirely based on the amount of this intervention that is used. I want to turn now and talk um, about um, one of the more difficult things in terms of listeria control, particularly in wet food processing environments, and that is its ability to establish residence in biofilms. And I want to talk about um, a non-pathogenic uh, microorganism that is frequently found in produce, and that's a bacterium called Pseudomonas. So just to give you a little bit of difference between what Pseudomonas looks like and Listeria, I put this slide in here. So Pseudomonas is gram-negative, non-spore-forming, rod-shaped bacterial genus. There are a large number of species that have incredibly diverse physiology. Most of these are aerobic, uh, meaning that back and packaging controls multiplication. So it is a very common spoilage organism. 
and vacuum or modified atmosphere packaging does a good job to um, slow the rate of growth. Like listeria, it is psychotrophic, so it can grow under refrigeration conditions. Because of this wide metabolism, uh, many pseudomonads are primary produce spoilers. But what we're really interested in is this organism in the food manufacturing environment because the bacterium produces large amounts of exopolysaccharides that help in biofilm formation. This is a slide that shows you what happens. So when a microorganism comes into a manufacturing facility, it's usually present as a single cell or at a, what we call a clump of microcolonies. When that clump or that cell drops onto a surface, it could be a floor, it could be uh, a conveyor belt, it could be a piece of stainless steel, it could be a wall, it could be a light unit, it could be a pipe, it doesn't really matter. That cell can immediately attach to that surface through Van der Waals forces and hydrophobic interactions. So that initial attachment occurs instantaneously, and that cell really is difficult to remove just by running water over it, for example. If there's enough food and the temperature is right and enough water, then that cell that attaches can start to multiply and grow, and you can get a monolayer or a microcolony formed on that surface. If that population is not killed or removed through cleaning and sanitation, then that uh, microcolony can eventually develop into a mass of multiple cells with all kinds of other material in there and um, form what we call a biofilm. So here are some pictures of what uh, Listeria looks like when it attaches on a piece of stainless steel. So again, this is a piece of stainless steel that I put Listeria on. I put it under running water for 30 minutes and this is what was still attached. So again, they, they attach very readily. This is what a microcolony looks like. So if you give enough time, food, and moisture, that population of attached cells begins to multiply and grow. Eventually, on the top slide, it forms a monolayer. And then if things get really nasty, then you get a mass of biofilm, such as um, the figure on slide B. This is a picture of what that exopolysaccharide architecture looks like. So again, these cells become very firmly attached and very difficult to remove in a biofilm. Now I want to talk about um, why uh, Pseudomonas and Listeria have a special relationship in a biofilm. Um, one of the um, biological interactions in, in terms of synergism is commensal also. And this is where one organism is benefited by the interaction while the other is unaffected. And many, many years ago, uh, we did a study showing that when Pseudomonas grows uh, in advance of Listeria monocytogenes contamination, then it creates an environment that makes Listeria grow better. And so that's where Listeria was benefited, but Pseudomonas had no impact um, by the presence of Listeria. And again, Pseudomotus is a primary environmental surface colonizer and a prolific biofilm former. So what happens is that uh, Pseudomonas breaks down proteins and forms free amino acids. Well, this just shows you that Listeria monocytogenes is, is not a proteolytic organism, so it needs to get at those amino acids from its environment. And if Pseudomonas can provide that, look what happens to the growth rate of Listeria. So on the x-axis, leucoglycine is just a measure of amino acids and um, peptides that are liberated by pseudomonas. So as that concentration increases going to the right, the generation time decreases. So generation time just simply the amount of time it takes for listeria populations to double. And you get a nice dramatic um, increase in the growth rate due to that proteolysis. <coughs> So I'm going to finish up by uh, just reminding you that when you uh, look at your production environment, how do you know whether or not you've got listeria monocytogenes there unless you do testing? Obviously, I'm biased because I work for a laboratory testing business, but that really is the only way you can get empirical scientific evidence to suggest whether your listeria control plan is working. 
So in order to help you with that, we offer uh, some competitive logistics in terms of um, if you have a facility near one of our uh, laboratories, we have an extensive courier route network. If you are not near one of our laboratories, we also have an industry-leading um, uh, transport system called Express Micro that we partner with UPS. So we have um, a laboratory in Louisville, Kentucky, where um, UPS becomes your courier. We get samples starting at 1.30 in the morning, and um, we cut out a leg of that uh, shipping samples. And so we can get uh, a pathogen test result potentially back by 9 a.m. the next day after we receive those packages early that morning. So again, um, that usually gives you uh, your data when you come to work in the morning, whereas uh, if you're using other laboratories, you will be lucky to get those after 6 p.m. that day. So again, how this works is you can uh, put uh, samples in pre-labeled shipping boxes that we provide to you. Um, you can have UPS be your courier, so they can either pick up at a time uh, meeting your expectations, or if you're near a drop-off uh, facility, you can drop those off at that UPS facility. And then uh, UPS handles the shipment. We've got a dedicated chute at the UPS facility, and we pick those packages up early in the morning, and we start an early morning shift to set those samples. So with that, We've got uh, abundant time here to address any questions that you may have. Uh, please use the, uh, uh, the queue box, and uh, Karen will start forwarding those to, uh, to me as, as time permits. And if you have any questions that we don't get to here verbally, um, I will follow up with you uh, privately by email. So I do want to thank you very much for your time. Again, this was, this was a very quick run through of uh, some best practices. And um, uh, feel free to reach out to me afterwards if you have any other subsequent questions you would like to get an opinion on. So thank you. I'll turn it back over to Karen. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. And thank you for your wonderful insight on this topic. Um, like uh, Dr. Marshall said, um, at this time, go ahead and put any questions that you have into our queue um, by clicking on questions and typing in um, your question. We're going to start off here with this question, Dr. Marshall. Um, can you recommend a wash tank or spray bar chemical that works to eliminate listeria from produce? OK. Um, it's very, very challenging for me to recommend an individual chemical for the following reasons. Um, one, I have no understanding of the nature of your process, your products, nor your expected outcomes. So there are many vendors of um, these wash water chemicals, as well as many vendors of uh, spray bars and wash tanks. My recommendation is, is if um, you haven't validated what you're currently doing, please do so. Uh, but also talk to the vendors of these various pieces of equipment and various chemical providers and ask uh, to see their validation uh, for products that you are particularly processing. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, how many environmental monitoring samples do I need to take and how often should I be testing? The number of environmental samples to take, uh, again, I can't give you a, a very easy answer um, because it depends on the complexity of your process and the size of your facility. Um, you uh, need to be making this determination based on that complexity, and the regulators also will not give you any recommendations on number of samples to take. Uh, you can also look at um, the environmental monitoring resources that we have available to you on our website. Uh, particularly, the environmental monitoring guide will give you some guidance in terms of um, frequency. In other words, what are some industry practices? best practices for how often you should collect samples. But in terms of the number of samples to take, that really is dependent on the um, size and complexity of your facility. Thank you. Uh, the next question that we have is, what is the, rec what is the recommendation for zone one testing? OK. For those of you unfamiliar with uh, the zone principle of environmental monitoring. 
Um, zone one typically refers to anything that is a direct product contact surface or a, a processing environment that is in very, very close proximity or has the ability to touch product. So this could be things like cutting tables and knives, employee hands, conveyor belts, wash tanks, um, um, packaging uh, systems, and so forth. And our recommendation there is because these are uh, direct product contact surfaces, if you test for Listeria monocytogenes and you find Listeria monocytogenes on those surfaces, the expectation is, is that product is contaminated and has the potential for uh, a recall event. So typically, most people would recommend that you test for Listeria species on those zone one surfaces. And if you find Listeria species on those surfaces, then you could do subsequent testing to decide what to do with product disposition. Thank you. Um, the next question is, is wet packaging produce dangerous? Um, wet packing produce is a potential risk for the following reasons. Um, during produce processing, there is uh, the potential that you are um, cutting that produce uh, either intentionally or unintentionally and you're re releasing some of the nutrients of that produce onto the surfaces of, the, of that, out of those um, um, product surfaces, whether it's intact or sliced and diced, doesn't really matter. Uh, because of the availability of that nutrition then, uh, if you pack that product wet, now you've got nutrition, you've got moisture, and because Listeria can grow at refrigerated temperatures, you're potentially creating a situation where Listeria could multiply fairly rapidly on the outside of uh, surfaces of that product. And so if you can remove that moisture prior to packing, you're at least taking out one of those contributing factors that could impact the ability of Listeria monocytogenes to grow during storage, transportation, and retail display. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, what are the swab sampling differences between a dry pack cooling produce operation versus an operation with a wash step? Okay, again, one of the advantages you have if you're doing dry processing is you're not going to have a proliferation, excuse me, a proliferation of water in that processing environment. And we know that Listeria um, has a um, unique ability to grow in that processing environment when there's water there. So in that case, I think it stands to reason that your risk will be lower in a dry pack operation for environmental contamination than it would be when you're using uh, wet processing. And as a consequence, the number of samples that you may want to take in your environmental monitoring program should obviously be based on risk, and so you might be able to argue a uh, fewer number of samples in a dry pack uh, situation. Thank you. Um, our next question is, how fast can Listeria entrench on equipment? Okay, well, uh, Again, a very difficult question for me to give a definitive answer for, but basically if the microorganism gets onto equipment, so if it's on an easy to clean and sanitize surface, then the microbe is going to attach. But when you're doing your daily cleaning and sanitation, you should be able to kill and or remove that attack cell from that surface. On the other hand, the microorganism gets into a bolt hole, into an open tube, into a trench drain, into a floor drain, and between a crack between a, uh, the floor and a wall, where there's some physical protection from your cleaning and sanitation routine, then the organism may not be killed or removed by your daily cleaning and sanitation practices. And so under that circumstance, that's where the organism could start to multiply and grow um, get involved in a, in a biofilm situation, 
and then persistently shed cells into that processing environment. So again, it varies greatly on where that cell lands in that environment and what that little microenvironment is in that location will determine how fast Listeria can proliferate and grow. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is going to be our last question, the one I'm about to ask. Um, we did have a couple um, other questions. Uh, Dr. Doug, Douglas Marshall will be through email here in the following days. Um, so our last question uh, right now is, um, if you are packing whole produce RIC with no wash step, for example, selecting and pack, packing blueberries, would you recommend Listeria SPP testing? Well, in that case, what you're probably, I, I guess I'm thinking that there, uh, I'm going to have to make some assumptions on this, and that is Listeria species testing of the finished product. And my answer to that is, if you do not know what your risk is of that um, commodity coming into your facility, um, how do you know whether any of your subsequent processing steps will control the steria on that product if it is coming in contaminated? So I, presumably the only intervention that you're using is refrigeration. And that may be the only thing that you have other than sorting. And that may be the extent of your listeria control plan. Uh, ideally, the um, prevalence rate will be very low on blueberries. But again, in your particular situation, I have no idea what that is. The second component of that is listeria species testing in the processing environment. Again, if you are routinely bringing Listeria monocytogenes in the facility on the raw material or the harvesting materials, the sacks, the, the trucks, the boxes, whatever it is you're using, um, do you have a situation in that plant where that Listeria monocytogenes could potentially proliferate? And if you do, then you may want to do environmental monitoring and ensure that your control plans are working to prevent that proliferation. Thank you, uh, Dr. Marshall. Uh, that was our last question, so this concludes today's webinar. Again, Dr. Marshall, I'd like to thank you for your insight and for your time. Everyone who tuned in for our webinar, thank you for um, spending an hour on this Monday with us. Um, we will be sending out an email here in the next one to two days with the recording of the webinar. Um, thank you again to everyone. Have a good day.